Ladies and gentlemen, fellow travelers on the road to a climate resilient future, I'm glad you could make it to this online webinar. Today is an important milestone on our journey to the International Climate Adaptation Summit on the 25th of January 2021. That day, global leaders will launch a comprehensive global adaptation action agenda, setting out concrete new endeavors and partnerships to make our world more resilient to the effects of climate change by 2030. There's no time to waste. Every minute, as I'm speaking to you now, almost one million tons of ice melts in Greenland and Antarctica. The COVID-19 crisis shows how vulnerable we are, how unprepared we are to respond effectively when a pandemic catches us by surprise. But climate change is no surprise. The effects are apparent here and now. Droughts, floods, heavy storms, rising temperatures and a rising sea level. We're in trouble now, so we need to adapt now. Let's share knowledge and expertise on this. Let's join forces around the world to accelerate adaptation action on a much larger scale than ever before. I won't stop repeating this call to action. Our country, the Netherlands, has made a name for itself through centuries of water management and adaptation. So today we're showcasing some examples of Dutch innovations. Nine interactive webinars focusing on Dutch adaptation approach and how we can share this knowledge with the rest of the world. EcoShape is about building with nature. It's obviously the best way to counter the effects of climate change. Nature is by far our most important ally but what are the ingredients for successful collaboration? What are the main challenges? I'm looking forward to reading the book you're launching today. My personal goal is to help scale up global efforts in adapting to the inevitable effects of climate change. I'm happy you're joining me in this venture. I wish you all a constructive and inspiring day. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome in this uh, webinar on, uh, about building with nature, uh, in which we first will start uh, with uh, a discussion about the book. But before that, I would like to disclose something. Uh, when I started my job as a Director General of Water Management in 2008, my first official deed was starting the EcoShape Foundation, and it's a great honor and also quite special for me to be part of the harvesting moment of 12 years of working on uh, building with nature in several uh, instances. So thank you so much for uh, asking me. Um, we are discussing about a book which is having the title Building with Nature, Creating, Implementing and Upscaling Nature-Based Solutions. So, during this webinar, we will discuss the past and everything that we could learn from all the experiences over the 12 years, but it's also about the future, and we will come back, back to that when we talk to our future experts. But first of all, I would like to introduce you to Henk Nieboer and Peter Glas, who are here uh, um, to discuss and to uh, the content of the book, which was edited under the leadership of Henk, uh, and will be handed over to uh, Peter Glas, the Dutch Delta Commissioner, who is more or less a per the person to hand over this book, because he'd probably be able, as the very important person internationally, to uh, bring the, all the lessons learned uh, to the future. Henk. Um, when I was invited, I thought, making a book, is this, is this still something of 2020? And um, uh, could you explain a little bit what is your purpose? What is the legacy that you want to put into uh, the book, but also into this uh, webinar? Yes, <coughs> Annemiek, thank you for this excellent introduction. Um, now, a book is uh, still something of this time, in my opinion. Uh, we can share a lot of knowledge to, uh, uh, to, the, to the internet. Uh, we are learning every day now more and more how easy that is and how effective. But still, 
a book has its own allure. It's, it's seductive. If you uh, make it well, it lies on the table. You cannot resist opening it. That's something different than switching on your computer and uh, click through a few uh, blue lines. So that's why we really wanted to make this book. And uh, it has been an accelerating process. Uh, the EcoShape Consortium is a consortium of many parties. And uh, it's amazing how many inspiring and passionate people uh, have contributed to all to this book. Uh, and, uh, a book which is not a technical guideline, it, uh, but it's also not uh, a mere inspiration book. Uh, what we want to achieve with this book is that uh, building with nature is seen as a real contender to solve society's challenges, taking into account the major crisis that we are facing, the biodiversity crisis, the climate crisis, but also uneven development across the world. I'm convinced that nature-based solutions are the way forward if you want to tackle these crises. And um, in the book, we have uh, shown uh, what are building with nature solutions. Uh, we have made a large inventory of them, have described how they, uh, yeah, how they play out in six different landscapes. So for these six landscapes, uh, the reader can see uh, yeah, what you can do uh, by using the forces of nature and by enhancing nature, and also uh, what the effects will be. Uh, so we hope that will convince decision makers uh, to see this, uh, uh, this kind of solutions as real contenders uh, for, this, uh, for solving society's challenges. Um, well, behind this book, there is an, also an online platform um, this platform gives us inspirational pro projects, but also practical guidelines. Everything that we have learned over the past 12 years, we have tried to compile in these guidelines so that they can, uh, this knowledge can be used for future replication and scaling up. Uh, this platform, by the way, is also being launched today. Um, so everybody can uh, take a look at it on our website already. Um, Moreover, uh, we have also compiled in the book the experience of scientists, policy makers, communities around the world. Uh, we have invited them to reflect with us on building with nature, on nature-based solutions. What are the experiences so far? What do see people as necessary uh, to be arranged to make this possible? And we have reported upon uh, this in our book. You can read about it in our book. And uh, the most important thing, I guess, uh, is my feeling, is that we also have identified six enablers. If you want to create nature-based solutions, if you want to be building with nature, you have to tackle six uh, different enablers. Uh, we will uh, hear more about it later. But we describe them in the book and also show uh, what can be done uh, uh, yeah, to arrange that these enablers uh, will enable you uh, to create a building with nature solution. And I'm very honored that uh, Peter Glas is here. Uh, he's the most important person in our sector in the Netherlands uh, because he is uh, responsible for uh, uh, the, the future safety of our country, of our Delta, the Delta Commissioner. Um, central uh, in the strategy of the Delta program is adaptivity. Uh, now, uh, in my opinion, Nature-based solutions, building with nature, is, uh, is a very good way to include adaptivity in your solutions. So I would like to formally present this book to you, but not after having uh, said that this book will be available uh, from, uh, will be ready in full print uh, at the end of November. And it will be available in bookstores across the world uh, from January. So uh, for you, the honor. Uh, so you have a headway, uh, a head start uh, now. And uh, I hope that it will inspire you and your program uh, to really be building with nature. Here okay. you are. Thank Peter. you. Yeah, <laughs> I have to pick it up myself. Yes, yeah. uh, that's, <laughs> the, that's the new normal. <laughs> so uh, I gladly do this, Hank. Thank you very much. I think it's an honor on my part to be able to, to have this book. And then maybe if you allow me some thoughts that came to mind talking about books, is this something of this time? Well, books have changed the world, many books through history, spiritual books, religious books, legal books, 
And there's one book that comes to my mind. Um, when I was 16, I see a couple of young people there. When I was much younger than you, 16, there was a book, and I, it's still on my shelf. It's Limits to Growth uh, by the Club of Rome. And I still, sometimes I leave through it and I see the, so the markings in there, in there, along with the paragraphs that I put down as a 16 year old. Then with hindsight possibly, I decided to go um, uh, and study biology and later on law. And then I ended up in Delft, what is now Deltares, um, amongst civil engineers, adding my perspective as a biologist uh, and a ma mathematician. And so this all comes together. And it is after 37 years, perhaps now, uh, if I look back on my career, uh, to be able to hold this book now, which holds so many, uh, I haven't had a sneak preview, by the way, <laughs> into this uh, preprint, but I will certainly look at it and, uh, and really uh, will promote it. Uh, because it's the way forward and the motto of the Delta Pro one of the mottos of the Delta program is soft where we can and solid if necessary well soft is nature-based solutions are softer feminine you would argue yeah. perhaps but still I think uh, so this is really uh, a, a milestone uh, a marking in history and uh, hopefully across the globe it will be bought <laughs> many times over. So thank you very much, Henk, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is a great moment. Uh, and of course, if uh, our minister would be here, we would, of course, also thank her very much for her inspirational talk. And also, we are so grateful that she uh, personally is involved to, uh, in a very passionate way on uh, the road to climate adaptation worldwide. And Actually, something special happens here because I know that Hank is a, a hardcore engineer from Delft okay. and he started his career also in the strict solutions on water management. And for me, he is a, a, an amazing example of someone who be, he became very passionate and open-minded to uh, the, the combination of uh, the, the, the real engineering approach of system modeling and uh, knowing the system and trying to change it because we as engineers want to change the world we want to improve the world and at the same time learn to live with the dynamics of nature and also use the inge ingenious way that uh, nature-based solutions work um, bringing me back uh, for some last words uh, of, uh, of Henk. Henk, actually, if you, you, I know you, you are a grandfather now, and um, so you're also reflecting on the future of the coming hundred years. Probably you are helping the kids who will live there. Um, can you give us um, a few personal remarks on uh, your legacy and what you really hope that we uh, if we uh, bring to the table the young people will do to uh, give also your grandchildren a good, a, a prosperous future? Yes, well, uh, I'm glad that the camera was not pointed at me uh, a few seconds ago because people would have seen me blush uh, with so many compliments. But actually my last, uh, uh, my latest grandchild was born only three months ago. So uh, I'm holding him uh, quite regularly, yes. Um, what I would like to see as a legacy uh, and what I would like to see younger generations to pick up is that um, uh, there's a new uh, uh, film by David Attenborough and in this film he says uh, we need to rewild the world uh, because we can still restore what has been lost in terms of biodiversity, in terms of nature. And we really need to do that because uh, the trend is, uh, is going in a very wrong direction with regard to that aspect. But he also says, and that's easy. And I have read critiques in the, in the press that he was uh, uh, taking it too easy. But I am convinced that we can counter this trend if we see every infrastructure project that we need to undertake to adapt, for instance, to climate change or other uh, infrastructural projects, we need to see them as an opportunity to restore what has been lost. 
And building with nature is one of the ways that we can do that. And I sincerely hope that we will find a way forward in this way and that the young generation will, uh, will build this out. Uh, we are only at the beginning and uh, yeah, we'll make this happen. Okay, thank you so much. Time's running out because I'm, I know, I'm aware of the fact that the Delta Commissioner, Peter, has uh, other appointments. So I would close this part of the program. Don't switch off because we have very interesting discussions about the six enablers that are paving the road to success, successful uh, implementation of Building with Nature. Thank you so much. And we will look through a small film which explains the six enablers. A lot has changed since EcoShape came to life 12 years ago. Globally, in the case of climate change, and especially in the context of building with nature. Let's look back at what the situation was like when EcoShape was established. EcoShape came to life, I think for several reasons. An important reason is that in our industry, in the dredging industry, in the international projects, we ran into so many restrictions on the effect of, for instance, stability while, while doing our dredging activities. And it was only one of the examples to the way we design hydraulic infrastructure. And that is actually why we, we started to sort of initiate a movement that we these days call Building with Nature. Back in 2007, when we started the initiative, I think people were really positive. We did not have that much problems actually to gather a consortium and both on the, on the side of the uh, private companies, our public clients and the knowledge institutes, there were a lot of people interested to join. So it actually, it sort of launched itself quite easily. Designing hydraulic infrastructure is not a one size fits all. It's an, an integrated solution, which is not the same at every location. So what we thought that was necessary is that you design a concept on let's say a, a more generic scale and that you can from that concept drill down into the several landscapes and then design project solutions for the landscape. It was and it is a complex adventure. I think it's a, a transition in not only designing but also in collaboration. That is what Building with Nature stands for. So it's the integration of, let's say, the physical domain and the, the ecological domain, but also the domain of knowledge institutes, private companies and public clients and these days NGOs. So we, we needed a different way to collaborate, not only on the content, but also within the organizations and between the people. Analysis of practical cases has resulted in the development of six enablers that form a solid basis for building with nature projects. When you want to realize building with nature in practice, we have seen that you really need six enablers. On the one hand, you need system knowledge, technology knowledge, in order to really make the solution work in practice. Secondly, you need to know what the stakeholders are and the multiple, to see that the multiple benefits really address some stakeholder needs. Thirdly, there's an institutional embedding. It must fit in the context of the laws and regulations that are, uh, that are in place. Fourthly, we see that we need a sound business case and we need to include all the different benefits, even the soft ones like nature or landscapes. We need to include that into this uh, business case. What we also see is that because of all these dynamics, it's necessary to be adaptive. To have adaptive monitoring, management and maintenance in place. And that's really different than traditional hydraulic infrastructure. And lastly, we also need to build capacity. When more people know what building with nature is, how it works and how it operates, we will get more building with nature implemented. Of course, I hope that it lasts and it should be even more sustainable in a way that people should think that it's, you know, it's the normal alternative to the traditional way of designing. This is what we have to build our future on. After 12 years of EcoShape research, we know a lot about building with nature. But what we do also do know is that it's really always is context specific that we really need to approach any project on its own, with, together with the local communities. And for any time, it's now that we can take this on as we are facing climate change, 
biodiversity losses, and we can tackle all these issues integrally, locally, and together with the community. Welcome back um, in this webinar on nature-based solutions. And we saw in a very short, condensed way uh, the takeaway from 12 years' experience on building with nature projects. And it's great that in, in this program we, we tried to accelerate the learning process by taking uh, the success, key success factors, but also what was said very clearly, it's always context dependent. And that's why we think that it's uh, also adding value to talk to the people who really uh, made it work and to ask them to reflect on the six enablers that are uh, uh, analyzed in the book that we've been discussing about. And I will discuss with you with Egon Baldal, uh, Hul Posthorn and Femke uh, Tonijk. And I will start with Egon. Egon, you are International Project Manager at the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. Uh, could you just reflect a bit on and, and take us to your personal experience with the project and what you encounter to be the key success factors or the most difficult issues to overcome? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, a very inspiring uh, movie, um, if you ask me. Um, it's so condensed and it seems so simple, but on the other hand, it is really complex. And there's, a, there's several levels of ambiguity in, in the story. Um, in, in a way, we are um, approaching this from a very scientific way, and we have to delve deeper into knowing how things work, and that's not just the systems themselves, but also how do we get um, uh, monetizing data and build better business cases. It's all uh, uh, grappling at the, at the edges of science, on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, it is really about people. It's about the local community. It's about their stakes. It is about um, what people believe in and what they go for. And combining those two directions seems contradictory. Uh, yeah. But they are not, because this is building with nature. And in essence, building with nature is about building with people. And they have to be convinced, because building with nature is not a, a religion. Um, it is a science. And we need to engineer on the one hand. On the other hand, it is the work of people and people have to believe in stuff. And I think that both Roel and Femke will uh, address these um, uh, issues. Uh, uh, Roel has a very in interesting uh, uh, story about how personal commitment to a certain um, area can help building with nature really uh, be implemented. And I yeah. think that uh, Femke can well, tell a lot about the Indonesia uh, part, where, where they, all these aspects uh, come to life as well. Yeah, but they will tell about it themselves. We will, yeah, we will <laughs> go to them, but first, uh, I'm not going to make it so easy for you, because ah. you are working in the Ministry of Infrastructure and uh, Water Management, and um, introducing a new way of dealing with uh, water management uh, projects, is also a bit uncertain. You are not quite sure. And I was a bit involved in the, the sand engine, which was presented in the film. Uh, and it, it also, it, as you say, it looks like we just came together and it, it went like this. Uh, but probably uh, you can also elaborate a bit on dealing with uncertainty in an environment like a ministry in which taking a risk is not a habit. So how did you, did you, do you overcome the resistance to, uh, uh, to uncertainty and being a bit entrepreneurial and just join the expedition on a new road to the future? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Uh, what I really believe in is that, well, actually two, two things. The first one being, this will not happen in a day. So we need patience, we need to um, explain this over and over again, we need to um, uh, convince people. Um, some people really don't believe in this, will eventually yeah. go away. Uh, uh, some new people will come in to the ministry. Um, 
this takes time. The fact that our minister is so enthusiastic about this is a great help. Uh, the fact that the Delta Commissioner is so enthusiastically uh, uh, taking the first book uh, from, from this meeting is, is, is a great help. It emphasizes how important it is, yeah. and we need that. But that's the top. What we also need is uh, the people on, on the floor who are involved in this. And there we need to convince people, on the one hand. On the other hand, I think it's very important that also in this meeting we have some young experts who are going to ask some tricky questions to us as well. Yeah. Um, but we have to build capacity, as Eric already pointed out. Uh, so the next generation will take this up easier and they will be employers of the ministry as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's time to, uh, to, to ask a little bit about, uh, uh, or, or uh, what I noticed from the film were two things you said, uh, of, of that Mar uh, Mario Lein uh, pointed out, think positive and join forces. Actually, you s are stressing that and say everything is important from uh, the bottom to uh, the pyramid. We need to, uh, uh, to be involved. But you also said something which triggers me, it says, it's not a religion, uh, it's also uh, science, engineering, entrepreneurial uh, uh, development of solutions. Uh, I noticed over the past 12 years that sometimes it is treated like a religion. And you also s use the word, uh, we have to convince the people. So how uh, do we uh, go through the next stage in which we want to scale up, in which building with nature or nature-based solutions are no longer seen as soft solutions which are um, uh, coming from a more religious or, or green uh, uh, um, thinking people area instead of uh, just the best way to treat uh, adaptation issues. Do we have I, a suggestion for that? To be how we overcome the image that building with nature is soft and is something to do with religious. Uh, conviction? Um, I think actually that we are on a tipping point of that. Um, and maybe because of this book, uh, th that's part of that. But also, uh, for example, the, the cooperation we have with the United States uh, Army Corps of Engineers and the British Environment Agency on making a natural nature based featured handbook, uh, a really thick book which, well, comprises all that we know thus far. Um, the, the, the international cooperation I have with uh, Interreg, uh, Norci region, um, it shows that over the world, uh, there are a lot of different organizations who are eager to learn, who are con convicted to a certain extent, but they are not convicted because they, because out of ideology, uh, they are convicted because they see that this actually works with the uncertainties di that we encounter in, uh, in, in the future, uh, with uh, um, uncertainties around climate change, but also about, around well, how will COVID develop, uh, how will we treat our uh, future uh, 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 surroundings, knowing that they are no longer static anymore. They never were, but we always thought, thought they were. Um, so we are at the tipping point of gaining mass there. Now, that's why I want to stress the importance of um, the scientific part of this. And uh, as Eric already pointed out, uh, for example, asset management. We need to know of our uh, pilots, of, our, of, of the size, the case studies that we have. How do they perf perform? What do they yield? And how uh, can we learn from that for future implementation? And if we know that, then we take them to a level which comes close to um, a knowledge base as we have from, say, traditional civil engineering. And then it becomes one of the things of the toolbox. Yeah. But it is a, a difficulty that eh, what was also said in the, in the, in the uh, come from the insights is that it's always about context, which means that we cannot simply duplicate projects. Is there enough money available for a good research and scientifically based? Because we work project by project by project. So how do we overcome uh, the difficulty of uh, gaining interest in uh, uh, data sampling, modeling, uh, research on what we're doing? Because it's also something which takes time, building with nature. So it's not, a, it's not cheap. It's not cheap, it's not fast, um, but 
it will work. And uh, that's what uh, I think uh, Ecoshape has shown in the past 12 years. And that's why we are now, that's why the book is here. Yeah. Um, and that's why uh, the US Army Corps is on board as well. And large institutions that are maybe indeed not traditionally so convicted of that these soft uh, uh, issues work. Um, we have to take this step now into the future. Uh, and that's why I again want to stress that the, the capacity building, the taking along the, uh, uh, the younger generations and showing them the science behind this, that will make it be adopted in the long run. So I also Slow. hear a plea for m going on, moving on also, not only with the implementation and scale up of the everything we already know, but keep on going with research and uh, development of new applications or new methods based on nature-based principles. I think it, that is very important, and institutions like Deltaris can add a lot to that. Uh, I'm, I think it's time to move to the next uh, <laughs> movie, which will introduce a little bit the work of Roel. Thank you so much. Marka Vaden. In the past decades, fine sediment accumulated in the Marka Mir, disturbing the ecosystem and leading to declined bird and fish populations. Something needed to happen to restore this ecosystem. Then the building with nature solution was found. The surplus of sediment was used to create nature islands, islands that would improve water quality and create a new nature and recreational area. In 2018, the first islands were completed. Two years later, Marka Vaden already attracts a wide variety of plants, birds and fish. Marka Vaden, a unique building with nature project and a source of inspiration for others. The Marka Vaden probably for the international people who are uh, in this webinar, you don't know, but I think this is the most, one of the most famous projects in the Netherlands. And I'm very uh, pleased that we have Roel here, Roel Posthorn, who is the project manager of uh, Markerwalde, working for Natuurmonumenten. Uh, Roel, can you take us on uh, the, the birth of this initiative? How, where did it came from, what were, yes. and how do you reflect on the enabling factors in this? Yes, I'm glad to do that. Um, so Marke Wadden is part of uh, Marke Meer uh, in the central uh, part of the Netherlands. It's the remain of a very large scaled land reclamation scheme in the Netherlands in the 20th century and um, causing quite a lot of problems. Marke Meer could be considered as a, a multi-problem landscape as we see in many places in the world. Uh, there's a problem with water quality, a problem with water safety, decline in fish stock and bird life. Um, there's limited room for economic growth on the borders of the lake. Um, but maybe even one of the most important problems I discovered was a complete lack of love. There's about two million people live around Markermeer and they hardly have any connection with the lake. So we developed the idea of Mark Wadden as a building with nature intervention in 2012 to break the deadlock, to try to solve with one, in, one intervention uh, several of these problems. So it's a multi-solution um, approach, building an archipelago of islands uh, in a step-by-step -step, uh, approach, because we also need to learn and adapt how we act in, uh, in restoring uh, this Markermeer. Um, our aim is to enhance the whole situation in Markermeer, um, we want to welcome people to work on the love of, uh, of the people for the landscape and we also work on the returns of investment. And we did it at high speed. The idea was launched in 2012. In 2016 we started uh, uh, the building process and we also started um, with our uh, research program, the, the knowledge and uh, innovation program on Marco Wadden. And in 2000. Um, 18, most of the islands uh, already were there, and this year we will finalize uh, the building works. So high-speed uh, execution and combining it with building up knowledge. 
And how did we do that? Um, well, one of the key things, I think, was that we brought together, you could say, four entities. Government, uh, businesses, science, and NGOs. And those four entities have each different drivers. So government looks at the different issues they have to deal with, healthcare, safety, uh, all these issues, uh, from a point of view of need and necessity. And government always has a shortage of money. So for your specific uh, uh, issue, there's always limited budget. Businesses, they look uh, for returns on investment. Science looks uh, for knowing and understanding. And the NGOs, their driver is longing. We long for beautiful places, for uh, a better future. And if you combine these four drivers, so not, not, not uh, uh, just, just try to, to see uh, that they work in the same direction, and we did that on Mark Wadden, you get a very, very strong energy. So that was very crucial. And the other thing that was very crucial was just having fun. Uh, having fun and raising about 85 million euros just to, to get the job done. And we did that in a fantastic energy. And I think that was also very crucial in this, uh, in this uh, project. So combining um, an approach in which uh, you try to address the different problems you're facing in a landscape that is strongly degrading is, I think, a key issue that building with nature can bring in many landscapes all over the world. Very interesting. Um, and um, I, 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 I have already a question from someone who is uh, here in the, in the room or in the webinar, mm -hmm. and he says, what role played enabler number four, which was, if I remember very well, the business case, yeah. in this project? Could you elaborate a little bit on that? <laughs> yeah, because I think the business case, uh, in a way, is very important, but we translated it into returns on investment. And if you look to returns on investment, the first thing you, you think you do, you invest money, and you want to have money back from your investment. But that's only one return on investment. Um, because if you take a broader approach, approach, and I think that fits very well with uh, the building with nature approach, you can have four returns on your investment. So one, re one return on investment is um, the return of natural capital. For Natur Monumenten and other NGOs, this is very crucial. And that benefit is really something we see on Marco Wadden because it's really very abundant in bird life nowadays. Uh, the second return on investment is on social capital. How do you connect the communities with your restoration project or your building with nature project? So that's also a crucial return on investment. And the third one is, of course, the economic return on investment. We try to, uh, have to, 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 uh, to have a little income by the visitors of the islands to at least have enough money to maintain the site also in future days. So we don't have to pay back the, f the total investment of building the islands. But then the fourth return on investment maybe is most important, and that's the return of inspiration. So that is really what connects people from the heart. And uh, so if you invest with in mind those four returns on investment, you have a very good business case. And you also said that actually the core of the, the, the problem was that although two million people were uh, more or less connected to the Mark yeah. Amir, that yeah. no one loved the Mark Amir. How is that nowadays? Well, it was for me extremely important to, to build a beautiful island and to make it accessible. So there should be a marina and there is a small settlement. And we literally welcome every person that that comes to the island. So you can sail to it. There is, uh, uh, hopefully next, next spring, there will be a regular ferry to the island. And so we also, during the building process, we organized just uh, interaction with the public. So we had a polling station during the last uh, uh, election of parliament in 2017. And it was just big fun and created a high energy. So, And it, it, it's really, by, by traveling to Mark Wadden, you can really experience the beauty of the Mark Amir. Yeah. Oh. 
Yeah, I think uh, it was at least for me, to me, a bit surprising how fast also the visible out, uh, developments of these uh, na nature uh, value uh, occurred. Um, also, the, the book is about, and, and also this webinar is about scaling up. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have ambitions to scale up the uh, Marco Water to uh, in the future? Well, the official name of the project is first phase of Marco Water, so the first step. Um, so, so we consider that it will be necessary if you want to enhance the whole Marco Mir uh, to scale up in this in this uh, Marco Water region. Uh, the project. We learn a lot from this first intervention, so we try to learn to take the next step even better than the first step. Uh, so that's one way of scaling up, but the other way of scaling up is looking at it from a little bit more distance as a degraded landscape and how can you find your way forward, find back the inspiration with the people that live in the landscape, uh, addressing issues like climate adaptation, uh, the loss of natural values, the loss of productivity, etc. And have you already uh, scanned the world <laughs> for similar situations <laughs> where people live around big lakes with this de yeah. and that you say, okay, my next challenge will be to fall in love with another yeah, yeah. bad well, lake? Uh, the world is, is <laughs> far too big that I can scan that myself. But the idea of Mark Wadden already um, uh, led to quite some interest from, from people all over the world that uh, came to visit the project, learn about it, and we also had some interaction also with, uh, with some other countries uh, already. So I think it's only the starting point, but uh, there's also an invitation for all other parties involved to, uh, to play that role. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Roel. Uh, we move on to the next small film, which is about an interesting project on mangrove restoration in Indonesia. Building with Nature Indonesia. Communities in northern Java are suffering from coastal erosion. With the local community, a Building with Nature solution was found. Temporary semi-permeable structures were built to dampen the waves and capture sediment. These structures create sheltered areas where mangroves can regenerate naturally. The mangroves increase flood protection and allow sustainable aquaculture practices that provide income and food for the community. Right now, mangrove seedlings have started to emerge. Although land subsidence is limiting mangrove restoration, the permeable structures have stopped coastal erosion in this area. Building with Nature Indonesia, a unique project in which the close collaboration with the local community and nature sets the example for other communities coping with coastal erosion. When we uh, go to Femke Tonijk, she was the project manager of this Building with Nature EcoShape project and she's working with Wetlands International. Uh, Femke, the floor is to you. Can you tell us a bit about this project? Thank you, Annemieke. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here today on this uh, event uh, on the road to the Climate Adaptation Summit. Uh, already as a small girl, I was really concerned about nature and it made me decide to uh, study earth science. Uh, and I now have 20 years of experience in earth science and nature conservation and restoration. Um, and it was a great pleasure that I could uh, start working with Wetlands International uh, eight years ago, a global NGO dedicated to uh, wetlands for nature and people, because it's my personal drive to link science to practice and policy for nature and people to live in harmony once again. And that's all the more exciting that I could work on, on building with nature because that's uh, an approach that does exactly this. Um, as, you sh as you've seen in the video, uh, the situation in uh, northern Java is quite severe. Uh, there is people uh, suffer from flooding on a daily basis simply by high tides. Two villages have already been swallowed by the sea. Um, and eight years ago, the Indonesian government also uh, flagged this. Uh, and then they said, there are uh, traditional solutions 
don't work anymore because the seawalls or dikes are sinking away in the soft sediments uh, that uh, are present uh, along the coast of uh, North Java. And also bringing back mangroves by planting didn't work anymore. These mangroves used to uh, dampen the waves and trap sediments, keep sediment in place. But yeah, the, the flooding was just too, uh, too heavy to, uh, to do that again. So then the Indonesian government uh, reached out to, uh, to Wetlands International and Ecoshape, uh, and with many partners, uh, Knowledge Institute, engineers, uh, NGOs and government, and of course the local communities, we started thinking of a solution. Um, and that's the solution that was presented in the video. Permeable structures trap the sediment so that the conditions are in place for mangroves to once again grow back. But it's never only about uh, establishing nature again. You always have to also work on the socio-economic conditions uh, because these socio-economic conditions have been the basis for the structure earlier. So that's why we worked uh, again with the local communities and local farmers to, uh, to uh, develop best practices for aquaculture and that has already boosted productivity and have, has brought new income. And we also saw that along with the mangroves, the fish uh, grew back, which also is a source of income. And people started also developing ecotourism opportunities. Hmm. The thing, one of the things that I'm most proud of is that we really were able to empower the local communities. They are now organized uh, across 10 coastal villages, and they are reaching out to their district and village government uh, to uh, get attention for their dire situation and also to receive support for, for their solution, and they've received support and budget to uh, continue maintenance um, of the building with nature measures. And then another key to success is that we, from the start, collaborated with the Indonesian government on a really an equal basis. We started with a small test, and we were learning together, we were making mistakes together, and we were transparent about it, and that also allowed for adjustments to the design, the communities suggested that we could do it a bit differently, uh, and that led to, uh, to a lot of improvement. Uh, and I think because of this, the, the government of Indonesia has actually already replicated this approach uh, in many uh, different districts. And we have also rolled out a program with eight knowledge institutes and universities, um, involved the professors and lecturers that are now training the next generation of, of engineers. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude because we really think, uh, as Wetlands International also, that building with nature is the future. Uh, it is a win-win solution. It is the way to address climate uh, change. Um, and I'm excited that uh, this will be uh, high on the agenda for the Climate Adaptation Summit. Thank well, thank you so much. It's very impressive. Um, are there, uh, what was the most difficult thing in this project where you said, okay, that was when I couldn't sleep at night because everything was at risk? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. That was when we uh, found out, we knew that subsidence, the sinking of the, of the land, was a problem, but we thought it was concentrated to, some, uh, to the city of Samarang, where there is uh, groundwater extraction from very deep wells. But we started finding out through monitoring that our monitoring poles were sinking. Um, and then we thought, what's happening here? And it turned out that the aquifer that is underneath the entire coastline, and when in Samarang water is pumped, it has an effect on the entire coastline. And then we started wondering, oh, is our approach still possible? Mm. But we also started to adapt. We learned that our structure still, well, uh, stopped erosion. We haven't seen the mangroves come back yet. They might or might not. But we adjusted um, by putting this high on the agenda again with the government. And uh, this led to a presidential task force uh, that uh, is developing now a roadmap uh, to address land subsidence. And building with nature features is one of the solutions to adapt to this subsidence and also to, uh, to mitigate it. Okay. So actually you had to adapt while adapting the area. Yeah. You have to adapt your own expectations and plans and... So, uh, okay, and where, where, how did you, um, and you also said the, the, we created a community ownership. Is this also, are they also now responsible for the follow-up or for the maintenance of the, in the construction or are, is this still a combined effort? Yes, of course, uh, the landscape belongs to the communities. So it's, it's, it's their land, it's, it's, it's their uh, 
future. And we've handed uh, over the ownership of the structures also to these communities. And we enabled them to, uh, to uh, take also charge of the maintenance. And they've reached out to government to also seek budget uh, for this successfully. So that's for the permeable structures, but also for aquaculture. Um, yeah, the, these best practices uh, yeah, speak by themselves. And, and, and the communities, we didn't just tell them what to do. We didn't convince them, but we engaged them in, okay, this is, we provided information, raised awareness, and then they were also developing solutions together with us. Okay. And they Very can keep nice. on doing that. Thank you. Um, let's move on. We will introduce, uh, invite to this uh, talk and discussion or debate on uh, nature-based solutions in this webinar, some young experts. We've already uh, spoken about learning from the past and experiences and handover, but of course there are always bright young people involved in projects and they uh, also have their own experience and questions to this panel. And I uh, like to uh, invite Niels, Niels Nijborg, uh, to come to the stand. Uh, Niels uh, works at Arcadus uh, Netherlands. He uh, uh, studied water management and engineering at the University of Twente. He was involved in the clay ripening pilot, which was executed under the uh, one of the wa Building with Nature projects. And um, we also asked in the preparation a personal mission. And uh, your personal mission is always try to find a win-win solution with benefit both, which benefits both the client and nature. Uh, Niels, the floor is to you. Yes, and my question is for uh, Egon, and it's related to one of the enablers, is the business case. Um, yeah, I'm involved in a Building with Nature project which uh, focuses on converting dredged sediment into clay for a beneficial use. And besides gaining knowledge about the clay ripening processes, uh, we also examine if there is a positive business case. Um, the business case, yeah, logically, it's related to cost and revenues. However, yeah, in my point of view, the added value for nature is often neglected in a business case. Um, um, I guess, yeah, I guess it's partly because uh, the natural processes take place at a longer time scale. Yeah, the project is a small time scale, but like sea level rise, it's a longer time scale. But I, I think it's also because the added value for nature is hard to quantify in terms of yeah, financial figures, which they use in, in a business case uh, often. Uh, so yeah, in order to compare uh, traditional solutions with building with nature solutions, or to find out if there is a positive business case, um, we need to find a, a way to quantify the, the, the added value uh, uh, for nature in a certain way. So my question therefore would be, um, what would your approach be to properly consider the added value for nature in a business case or in a trade-off between yeah, specific solutions? Yeah, uh, thank you. This is an interesting question, and uh, it is one that um, um, yeah, well, brings a lot of people to do research and to form uh, networks and groups around this. Um, <clears throat> On, in the EU Horizon 2020 project, uh, the, the, the program, there is a project uh, specifically on valuing natural value. So how do you evaluate the soft values that you mentioned? Um, I also know that the European Union is busy with um, uh, making uh, these soft values in the broad sense accountable. So making a monetary valuation of these data um, uh, crisp, so that you, they can be compared to one another. Uh, the same goes for uh, a similar initiative on uh, the United Nations level. Now, these are uh, processes that are vital for, for developing these tools, and they, they, again, they take time. Um, so, you asked me what my approach would be. Well, one is follow those developments stick to them closely, know what economists and accountants are talking about. Um, the interdisciplinary aspect of this um, cannot be, uh, uh, cannot be over-exaggerated. I mean, um, we are in a civil engineering world. You're asking a biological question, which I'm very happy with because I'm an ecologist. Um, and my answer is that yeah, well, we have to refer to economists uh, and accountants. A completely different discipline. Uh, 
Um, this points out that we have to work together to make a, uh, a knowledge base on dealing with this. Now, well, in the meantime, we don't have time for this because you want to do uh, projects at this moment because you're young and we have to get moving. Come on, people. So how difficult can it be? Um, I think that one of the most important parts of natural value is that we appreciate it. And, um, for example, I live in a, a peat meadow area in the Netherlands. Um, I cannot express m that in terms of money. So if we want, in a business case, to be this to be taken along, yes, it is possible in the long run, and we can, we can uh, well, rationalize things. But the most important part is take the people who have to decide about whether or not they're going to take a certain measure outside and let them experience and feel. That's a qualitative thing, um, but it is very vital. And that is exactly what Roel and Femke yeah. have been uh, talking about as well. It's about ownership and it's about the Yeah, per I the think it's also, if it, if it comes to, maybe you would like yeah. to add a little bit, Roel, yeah. because you, you gave the four uh, dimensions of valuing mm -hmm. the project. So yeah. probably you can add a little bit on it. Well, so, so the, uh, if the return on investment also is the re return of natural capital, that always, well, f for, for many stakeholders, that already can be enough. Uh, so to express everything in money, at the end of the day, it might not be possible. Love is not to be expressed in money. Um, but that's also, I, I mean, certain parts of, of your question you can address in money. For instance, in the Mark and Meer area, it's, it's quite specific that it has a, mm, how to say, a net gain mandate. So there is an agreement on European Union level that if you invest in improving the natural system, because it's now on a very poor standard, if you invest and invest and make it, make it good enough, it all also will provide uh, some room for economic activity again. So then you... Yeah, you can calculate a little bit. Yeah. yeah, we try to bridge between the disciplinary perspectives, but there is also a key message in the story of these three experts, which is that some things you you have to feel, experience, and love, and you and probably you could just ask the question to this person: What price is on the head of your kid? It's something you want to take care of, and this is a pro uh, we have to take care yeah. for our uh, system Earth, and some, some things you have to stop trying to yeah. find an economic way to value because it's unethical to do that with your own yeah. kids. So, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to invite Floortje Sirat. Uh, she is working at Witteveen & Bos. Uh, her back theoretical background is that she studied uh, policy management and construction, at the, and construction management and engineering both at the uh, University in Delft. Uh, she has been involved in building with nature projects uh, in the mangrove uh, restoration project. And her pa uh, personal ambition when it comes to building with nature is financing building with nature. Yes. Uh, Floortje, go Thank ahead. You. Thank you. Um, I'm going to follow along with the questions that have been asked before, um, considering business cases, I guess. Um, Femke is already nodding, but I'm not going to ask it, this question to you, but it's in line with what we have discussed in um, our work on the social cost-benefit analysis that we've performed in uh, the MAC in Indonesia. But I'm going to direct my question to Roel uh, concerning the Mark Corvada. Mm -hmm. um, you already mentioned uh, four types of return on investment. Um, so some... Um, some of those four are based on non-use benefits. So that's love and uh, mm -hmm. others that you've mentioned. Um, and my question is actually twofold. Do you think that uh, building with nature um, and scaling up building with nature is possible without um, the use benefits? So in terms of recreation or uh, visiting possibilities that are going to be possible at the Mark Arvada? Um, and second, um, how do you uh, prevent those use benefits um, to uh, disturb the, the most important uh, benefit that you're actually trying to achieve with building back the Marco Wallet? Yeah. So how are you preventing recreation to bother 
the nature uh, uh, reconstruction that you're trying to achieve? Yeah. Maybe to start with the last question, because that's, that's the most concrete one. Um, the idea with Marco Wadden was to, to have the first step of Marco Wadden uh, a large step, so uh, an extensive landscape of about 1,000 hectares. And only part of it has a marina and is accessible for people to visit. Um, so, uh, to have a very strict zoning uh, with one part with high natural values but also accessibility for people and other part where there is no access and, and nature can thrive as it goes. So that's, if you, if you work in small pilot projects, so in a research setting, it's much more difficult. But if you work on a practice, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a real-life scale and you do large-scale interventions, you also have more room to do proper zoning. Um, so I think that, that can be helpful. Uh, but to, and the question on the business cases, I'm struggling a little bit with, with that, of course. I, I, I was invited to present in Cambridge last year uh, on, on the Marco Wadden case for a group of uh, economic scientists. And, and I felt a little bit strange as uh, coming from nature conservation. But one of the... Uh, there also is a very strong economy in uh, charity money. It's a huge amount of money that is spent each year all over the world on uh, doing something good and uh, getting things started, um, addressing or helping the, the parts of the community or the NGOs or the stakeholders that, that want to, to come up for nature, for the landscape, for the beauty, for the softness, whatsoever. So, so they can be supported also in that way. And uh, as I see it on Marco Warren, you have the, the, the first investment is on your intervention. Mm -hmm. And for your intervention, you probably can find other, um, other, other means like this charity money to address at least this part of the, of the business case. But once you've done your intervention, it needs, to be, it, it needs to be managed in an adaptable way and maintained. And there... Uh, it can be very helpful in the case of Mark Wadden if you have uh, a situation where all productivity in the landscape has been lost, so a, a strong decline of fish stock, uh, hardly any recreational use. And if you can help to build that up again, you also have some small business cases that can help you uh, at least to, uh, to gain enough in income also for this uh, management in the future. So that's... It's, it's, it's a way of looking for different sources to combine everything and to, um, well, it worked out quite well on Marco Wadden and I hope it will be successful in other cases as well. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you one more question because I got uh, f uh, from the chat a question of Bas and he said, are there many opportunities for young engineers to participate in building with nature uh, movement? So do they all have to apply for a job at Witteveen & Bos, or what is the, the secret <laughs> uh, to, to get involved? Because people get enthusiastic by hearing your stories. So how did you got it, get, get on board? Um, yeah, I think we, but my colleagues here will, uh, I think, also assign that. Um, we get a lot of chances uh, to get on board with this uh, change in, in our work. Um, it's being taught at us uh, at university now. Um, and I think we get chances to get on board with seniors who work on this kind of projects. Yeah. So you would recommend, if you are really interested in this field, uh, to dive a bit, little bit into the companies and in the institutions that are working in the Netherlands on building with nature. You can find them with contractors, as we saw with Marjolein. Uh, you can find it in the engineering companies that are here, uh, but also in research institutes. But uh, probably you are also willing to, uh, to chat with them if they find their way into this uh, beautiful uh, area. So yeah, thank you, Abbas, for your question. Thank you, thank you. Floortje, for your question to rule. And uh, may I invite Floris van Rees. Floris uh, works, is, co is my colleague. He works at Deltares. Uh, his uh, theoretical background is biogeomorphology. Geomorph geomorphology. Morphology. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. 
I've learned something. He was involved in a, a project also in uh, Denmark, in Indonesia, and uh, the Kleirijperij and Marke Water. So more or less, you can ask questions to anyone. Mm. And your personal mission is paving the path towards a circular economy by the use of building with nature solutions. Mm -hmm. So can you explain that uh, quickly? To us, <laughs> uh, I, I think it's a very nice alternative to nature-based solutions instead of the the grey infrastructure that we used to do like 12 years ago, uh, and that's therefore also my mission. I was really motivated when I was in Denmark, still as a student, and I saw with my own eyes that nature-based solutions really worked, and therefore it also motivated me to start a professional career also in nature-based solutions. So therefore, I uh, joined forces at, uh, at Deltaris, and right now I'm in a multidisciplinary team of very young and motivated scientists. And what we want to do, we want to look for an uh, alternative for sediment management. So we used to uh, use chemicals like flocculants to consolidate the soil. Uh, however, uh, we also found that biological actors can also uh, better the quality of sediment. For example, we use worms, but we also use bacteria and algae. And we have seen that worms can consolidate a, a soil 2.5 times faster than uh, without treatments, which is a very nice result. However, I really want to uh, ask this question also to Femke, because I think she did a great job in terms of capacity building at uh, authority level. And sometimes uh, in this young team of scientists, we struggle a little bit to convince uh, authorities of our nature-based solutions because they say sometimes they are a little bit afraid of unwanted new equilibriums in the ecosystem. However, we try to operate our worms, for example, in a confined area, which could be very beneficial for, for example, the clay, uh, clay riperai. And we also use the, the native species from the adjacent ecosystem. So my question is, how do you convince authorities governmental authorities, that nature-based solution does not equate to a disruption of your ecosystem? Well, thank you for your question. Uh, this question is actually very close to my heart because in, during my PhD uh, studies, I actually studied bioturbation by uh, worms and other uh, uh, small fauna. And they're, of course, part of the ecosystem. They're nothing external. They, they are part of the bigger picture. Um, but, wait, but your question is, how do we convince um, government agencies to uh, be open for this? And I think it's really not a matter uh, of convincing, because then you, uh, then you are sort of higher than, than the one you, that you want to convince. So it's really about collaborating and uh, yeah, talking about everyone's different perspective, also different knowledge and different concerns, because these concerns can actually be very viable. And that also happens in Indonesia when yeah, sometimes we as scientists said, no, it, it should be like this. And then the community said, yeah, but, oh, but we experienced something else. And maybe they're right because they've been living there for a very long time. So yeah, really uh, open, we need to open our mind for a different perspective, traditional knowledge and also knowledge of, of, of the local people and of the government. And then, yeah, together you shape a vision and you will come towards a solution that may be the solution that you thought of or, or maybe different. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. I think that is a very clear recommendation to actually, which is jo going this road jointly together and also discover together how it works. Is any of you who wants to add something to that or comment on that? Very clear I answer, I think. <laughs> very clear yes, answer. Uh, yeah. Yes, very clear. I think the invitation is m is stronger than convincing. Yeah. 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 Inviting mm. stakeholders to join in. Yeah. It's a good a good uh, remark. Thank you so much for your introduction and your question, Floris. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to Caroline Wegman. Caroline, welcome to the floor. You are working at HKV. Uh, your theoretical background is coast coastal morphodynamics and river systems. Uh, I'm not informed at what university you were uh, studying, but uh, I was involved that you have been working on the Hans Bosse uh, dunes. We were now call it the Hans Bosse dunes. Uh, uh, previously, it, were, it was the dike and the guideline team. And all your personal mission in this is make building with nature a standardized standard option 
in all water safety projects. The floor yeah. is to you. Yes, thank you very much, Annemieke, for this nice introduction. I studied at, studied at the University of Utrecht, by the way, <laughs> for anyone thank who was you. wondering. Um, so I have a question for Egon. Um, as you mentioned, Annemieke, I worked on the Hans Bosse Dunes project. This is a created dune area in, uh, at the north coast of the Netherlands. Um, and this dune area actually replaced an existing sea dike uh, as a primary flood safety um, flood defense system. Um, and what I noticed at the Hans Bosse Dunes monitoring project, where I was part of the team, is that actually um, we find it very hard to um, yeah, adapt ourselves to the changes that happen to such a dune system. Because of course, due to the physical and ecological processes that happen, these dunes change shape and form, and also eco um, ecologically they change as well. And what I noticed in that project is that actually, because um, we find it so hard to deal with these uncertainties and dynamics, we, we uh, don't use it in our design of, for example, these dunes. Whereas actually sometimes these dynamics really help us. For example, in the Holzbosse dunes, sand blows into the dunes, grows the dunes, which makes them uh, able to grow, for example, with sea level rise. Um, so we still find it hard to communicate this and to adapt to this ourselves. So my question to you, Egan, is how do you think we can bring these advantages of this dynamic by behavior and uncertainties, bring this forward and more to life when communi communicating about building with nature solutions? Yeah, the, I'm very happy with this question because this is actually part of the, the Interact Building with Nature project that um, Rijkswaterstaat is leading. Um, and uh, at, the, at the very moment, um, colleagues from Rijkswaterstaat, but also from the uh, Danish Coastal Director at uh, Schleswig-Holstein and uh, Niedersachsen are working together in um, trying to get a feel for source pathway receptor modules. So where does scent come from? How does it move and where is it deposited? Uh, and that not just for a, a foreshore or a beach situation, but also for the dune area, because dunes still protect the largest part of the Netherlands, but are also of importance to uh, the other countries. So, yes, I'm happy that you asked this, asked this question. Um, how do we take into account these dynamics? Um, now that is, of course, dealing with uncertainty. And I was having a discussion about uh, uh, trees with uh, uh, Femke about this as well. Um, we want to have this incorporated in the long run in our legislation. Uh, but then again, we still have to know for certain how they work and how to calculate with that. And of course, we already do, because we think that a levy is fully stable and always there, but boy, if you uh, heard the, the story from Femke, every now and then something can subside and then you have like, uh, there will be piping or there will be other processes. Um, so you need to keep on monitoring what you're doing. And maybe in nature-based solution worlds, you need to do that more frequently, more intensely. Um, given that, um, the, the uptake of these uncertainties is really the next step. Uh, and in, indeed, you can approach that from the uncertainty part, but you can also approach that from the beneficial part. And the beneficial part is very interesting because, as we said earlier, um, we are in a situation where we no longer think about static uh, uh, environments, we think about dynamic environments. And especially these changing uh, aspects that give us the potential, give us uh, the, the, the feel, the reach to use the full potential of a dynamic situation. So, for example, we are in the, 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 the traditional real hard concrete structures, which we must use every now and then. I mean, uh, uh, that's what was said uh, by the Delta Commissioner and Hank Niebuhr as well. But we build them, and as they are, uh, they will be there for 100 years or 200 years. Um, and m nowadays we start thinking about adapting them as well. Now, nature-based solutions have this, this great aspect of being adaptable quite easily and doing that themselves. So if you, you work with those natural processes, you can let nature do that work for you. And that aspect should be incorporated in um, the asset management of nature-based solutions. 
making them more valuable. I also uh, have to look, keep a close look uh, a little bit at, uh, right. at my watch. <laughs> but I think you are pointing something very interesting, which is the paradigm shift that uncertainty is not only all only working into the, the, back si the bad side of the equation, but also offers opportunities, unknown opportunities of even uh, more reward of the solution, even more ab adaptive. I think that's a key message. Thank you for asking this question, which uh, brings us to the end of this uh, webinar, in which I think that we uh, had very interesting insights in uh, the real projects and the people who are leading this project and contributing to these projects. Uh, and they actually uh, stressed the importance of the enabling factors, which are written out and analyzed and presented in the book, uh, which, of course, I recommend you to uh, order. We will just give you a, a, a link to the email address uh, later on uh, to read this book. But I th also think that you added something to the book and the six enablers, because we had a little interesting discussion on enabler number four, the business case. And I, I think we may... Uh, probably come to a, a small intermediate conclusion that the word business case probably is misunderstanding the broad uh, benefits of, and the beneficiaries of building with nature. So that's something to work on for the next 12 years, I think, and which uh, was uh, very clear from all of you, which started with Henk uh, and his passion about this and, and, and endurance uh, of attention on this topic but also with all of you, it's about people, it's people's work, it's building uh, with nature with people. And you need the, uh, and the love, the attention, the dedication, uh, having fun, positive energy, personal drive. I wrote down words that you said, and which for me comes to the seventh enabler of building with nature, which are the people who make it happen. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for uh, joining us in this webinar. Uh, we are on the road to this Climate Adaptation Summit 2021, but we're actually all also, and more important, on the road to successful building with nature projects. Do you want to know more on how to implement building with nature concepts in your projects? Stay tuned and join our webinars. <laughs>